This is the first of two videos about intraocular lens implants. Intraocular lenses are used to replace the natural lens after it is removed in cataract or lens replacement surgery. In this video, we explore what inspired their design and highlights of various stages in their development. In the second video, we cover design features and visual performance of current lens implants and how they affect which lens someone having surgery might choose. Even though the subject of these videos is the lens implant, the big improvements in cataract surgery have come on two fronts, the surgical procedure to remove the lens and the development of the lens implant. This is the plan for this video. Let's start by recognizing that the intraocular lens implant is a marvel of modern medical technology. Up to the middle of the 20th century, cataract surgery was less than terrific. The procedure to remove the lens was not very refined, and rehabilitation of vision was very basic. So much so that the decision for surgery occurred when vision was reduced to the point where there was nothing to lose. The advent of the operating microscope and microsurgical technique beginning in the 1960s dramatically improved the procedure for removing the cataract. But a significant problem remained. Once the natural lens is removed, how to replace the lost focusing power? Technically, we describe an eye without a lens as aphakic, and we describe an eye with an artificial lens as pseudophakic. Before lens implants, vision was restored with high power glasses with thick, heavy lenses that caused significant distortion in vision. Contact lenses could supply the high power with minimal distortion, but required the ability to manage them, not ideal for the age group that was having cataract surgery. The real answer was to create an artificial lens. In a bold step, the first one was implanted in 1949. Since then, the aim has been to develop an artificial lens that functions as well as your natural lens. No easy task. The first part of designing a lens depends on how it fits into the eye after cataract surgery. The other major issue is that our visual world is not in focus at just one distance, which leads to multifocal lenses. We are going to leave it to video two to explore the general types of current lens implants we will cover visual performance with the advantages and compromises that would be useful to someone choosing a lens. We finish this video with a look behind the scenes at how lens implant power is determined. The first step in designing the implant is based on how is it going to fit into the eye after the natural lens is removed. To get oriented, we will briefly review the structure of the eye. The cornea is the clear window in the front of the eye that lets light in. It is the first part of the focusing system of the eye. The iris is the colored part. The hole in the center of the iris is the pupil. Right behind the iris is the lens, part two of the focusing system of the eye. In youth, its ability to change shape is what allows you to change focus from distance to reading. The ciliary body contains the focusing muscles, which are attached to the lens by small fibers called zonules. Lining the inside of the eye is the retina, a layer of nerve tissue that acts like film in a camera. Underneath the retina is the choroid, a layer of blood vessels that supplies the outer retina. And lastly, the sclera is the tough outer layer of the eyeball that gives it its shape. Regarding the lens, as a consequence of aging, two things happen to the lens. First is loss of flexibility, which leads to the need for reading glasses. That is covered in detail in the videos on presbyopia. The second is clouding of the lens called cataract. With age, the natural lens changes in color from clear to yellow green to orange to brown. With color change and loss of clarity, vision gets blurrier, yellower, and glarier. Color change also goes along with lens hardness, on one hand relating to presbyopia, and on the other hand, increasing the difficulty in breaking up a hard lens to get it out of the eye at surgery. What does that look like? 
This is looking into a normal eye through a dilated pupil using a microscope with a bright slit beam of light coming from the left side. The cornea is the curved vertical bar on the left. On the right is the lens outlined with dashed lines. This is a youngish, relatively clear lens. This is a middle-aged, mild to moderately cloudy and yellowed lens. This is a late-stage, densely cloudy lens. Structurally, the lens has different layers. Important for us is the outer skin layer called the capsule. At surgery, you want to remove the substance of the lens but preserve the capsule in place as the envelope that is going to hold the implant. Picture an imaginary avocado onion. The nucleus is hard like the avocado pit. The surrounding cortex is in layers like the outside of an onion all enclosed by a thin skin layer. When the lens gets cloudy enough to be bothersome and it is time to remove it, that is when cataract surgery happens. This would be an idealized surgeon's view through the operating microscope at the start of surgery, with the cloudy lens seen through the dilated pupil. To enter the eye, an incision is made at the edge of the cornea. Then forceps are used to open the front part of the lens capsule to gain access to the inside of the lens. Part two is removing the substance of the lens. That begins by using ultrasound to fragment the hard nucleus. This is the surgeon's view of the phaco instrument, dividing the hard nucleus into two halves, which will be individually digested. Then using vacuum to peel out the remaining cortex. The aim is to leave the capsule intact, ready to hold the implant. With the cataract out, everything is clear with a nice orange reflex. Part three, through the same opening, the lens implant is inserted into the eye. This is the surgeon's view of the lens implant emerging from the injector. The lens is maneuvered into the capsular bag and centered. It may surprise you to know the incision is self-sealing. No stitches are needed. The inner flap is held closed by the pressure of fluid inside the eye. Now the lens implant is nicely in place. This is looking in through a dilated pupil after cataract surgery. The arrowheads point to the edge of an intraocular lens centered in the capsule. The result, if the eye is otherwise healthy, for example, no macular degeneration, vision improves from cloudy to clear. The ability to remove a cataract by various methods has been around for a long time. So how did the inspiration for the replacement lens come about? One key question is what to make a replacement lens out of? The short answer is one of several kinds of plastic. The slightly longer answer of how that came to be is worth a minute of history. It begins with a World War II RAF fighter pilot in the Battle of Britain. On August 15, 1940, Flying Officer Gordon Cleaver took off on short notice but forgot his safety goggles. In combat, gunfire shattered his airplane's canopy and downed his plane, but he was able to parachute safely. Fragments of the shattered canopy damaged his right eye beyond repair. The left eye had retained embedded fragments, but as his ophthalmologist Harold Ridley followed him over time, he noted the fragments did not stimulate any reaction. The eye's tolerance of the retained canopy material inspired Ridley to create the first artificial lens out of the same rigid plastic, technically PMMA, commercially plexiglass and other names. The first lens implant surgery was started in November of 1949. After the cataract was removed, special forceps were used to grasp the lens and ease it into the eye behind the iris. Ridley published the results of his first 27 cases. These are the first 10. Here I have converted the vision results from metric to Snellen notation. It strikes me as remarkably good vision results for what was the prototype of a new technology. Without being too technical, it is also noteworthy how much the refraction numbers improve after just three cases. 
From our viewpoint, this is a remarkable innovation. However, at the time, Ridley met a lot of resistance. The idea of putting a foreign object into the eye ran counter to the medical culture of the day. It took a long time, many years, for the use of implants to become accepted practice. The story of Dr. Ridley and his inspiration is told in this book and a number of journal articles. Since then, lens design has come a long way. Ridley's original design was a simple round disc, the optic to do the focusing, but there was nothing to hold it in place. One of the first improvements involved adding arms or haptics to keep the lens in position. A typical modern lens is 13 millimeters long with the optic 6 millimeters in diameter. Here we need to pause and recognize that the route from initial inspiration to current surgical technique and lens design was not a direct or easy one. So far, we have shown surgery that keeps the capsule, technically called extracapsular surgery. However, for many years, the standard cataract procedure involved extracting the lens in one whole piece, including the capsule. Called intracapsular surgery, this left no capsule to support the lens implant. We showed one example of this at the beginning, using a cryoprobe that sticks to the lens and allows it to be dragged out whole. There were other methods. So, where could an implant go with no capsule for support? These were two options in general use through the 1970s and 80s. Option one was to use the iris, putting lens stabilizing struts through the pupil, somewhat like a button in a buttonhole. These are some of the variety of designs. We could say functional, but had problems. Option two, use the angle where the iris and cornea meet. Early design with closed loops or rigid plates or poor quality manufacturing had complications and got a bad reputation. But by the mid 90s, anterior chamber intraocular lenses were working well. This modern version you might still see in some situations, like if the capsule was torn at surgery and couldn't support a lens, or as an implant into an eye that previously had the lens removed. Let's do a brief comparison of intra and extracapsular surgeries, keeping in mind that the availability of lens implants makes a big difference in outcome. Extracapsular surgery results with the lens in the capsular bag. This is desirable because the lens is in its natural position, minimizing optical distortion. It is isolated from structures like the cornea and iris, minimizing other complications. Phaco emulsification needs only a small incision and is the easiest on the eye, but it requires an expensive instrument and support, so cost is an issue. There is manual extracapsular surgery, which uses only simple equipment, but is a little harder on the eye. Intracapsular surgery has the disadvantage that there's no capsule to hold back the vitreous jelly, which can come forward out of the eye. That significantly increases the rate of intraocular complications like retinal detachment. Lens implants that are placed outside the capsule can interact with the cornea, causing it to cloud up, and the iris, sometimes scraping off pigment and or causing chronic inflammation and glaucoma. Retaining the capsule has one disadvantage. It can become cloudy sometime after surgery. In high-tech countries, we can laser the capsule open, but in low-tech countries, that fix is not available. So in the broad view, the choice of surgery depends on available resources. In our high-tech country, it is almost uniformly FACO with the implant in the capsule. Part four. Back on the extracapsular path, the next big design change was motivated by an improvement in surgery using smaller incision size. This again is the surgeon's view at the beginning of surgery. We'll make a diagram out of this showing the iris, the dilated pupil, and the edge of the already open capsule. Surgery in the middle of the 20th century required a large incision to get the cataract out of the eye in one piece. 
the dashed orange line shows the opening approaches halfway around the cornea. Closure required 8 to 10 stitches. When the hard plastic lens implant came along, its size at 6 millimeters in diameter wasn't an issue because the large incision size required to get the cataract out. Beginning in the 1970s, phaco emulsification began to be used, which we described in the surgery section. With this method, the fragmented cataract could be removed through a smaller 3 mm opening. The rigid 6 mm optic was now an issue because it was too large to fit through the smaller incision. You could enlarge the incision, but the smaller incision was desirable because it meant a more stable wound, faster healing, and less astigmatism. Later on, this became a self-sealing incision. What to do about lens size? The answer was to make the lens out of a flexible material that could be folded. That began with hydrogel, then silicon, and now a soft acrylic material. In practice, the folded lens is loaded into a syringe and slowly injected into the eye, where it unfolds and is then positioned in the capsule. This is two views of the lens implant in position in the capsule at the end of surgery, the result we are looking for. In the extreme, lenses can be folded up and injected through an opening less than 2 millimeters. A Cochrane review does not confirm a significant advantage to going smaller than 3 millimeters. Part 5. A monofocal lens is a big improvement compared to no lens, but things could be better. Our activities of daily living don't all occur at a single distance. Yes, we need clear vision for distance and driving, but a lot of activities occur at arm's length, like a computer screen, sheet music, and the instrument panel of your car. And there is reading and close-up work. Since the 1990s, a lot of effort has gone into developing implants to better address the visual needs of daily life at all three distances. There are three categories of lens implants. We started with single power. To address multiple distances, we now have multifocal and flexible lenses. We will summarize the general properties of each lens type. First, the single power lens implant with one focal distance has its advantages, three in particular. It gives a high level of image quality. It has good performance in low light because the entire lens is gathering light. Also, it is the least expensive. Moving on to multifocal lenses. Early versions had two focal distances, but with a difference. One version had its foci set at far and near. The other version had far and intermediate. Each had a missing distance, so it became an option to mix them using one lens of each type. The current generation of multifocal lenses aims to improve functionality at all three distances. The trifocal lens divides light into three different focal points, whereas an extended depth of focus lens, EDOF for short, aims to broaden the depth of focus. Both seem to be working well, with the trifocal having an advantage at near. Last are the lenses that attempt flexibility. There are several design options, but this is the only one currently approved in the U.S. As we mentioned in the video on presbyopia, the focusing muscles of the ciliary body retain their ability to contract relatively late in life. The concept is that a flexible lens in the capsule could respond to muscle contraction by changing its position and thus its point of focus. The result? Measurements show some flexibility early on, but unfortunately by one to two years out there is minimal movement, probably because the capsule has become scarred and stiff. As a single vision optic, this lens retains the advantages of good image quality and night vision. We finish our introduction by recognizing that multifocal lenses have compromises. First, because you're trying to focus multiple images simultaneously, there's an initial period of neuroadaptation in which the brain has to figure out how to deal with multiple images. Second, the image quality may be reduced, 
more so at near. Third, night vision is more likely to have issues with halos and glare, and may be somewhat reduced in general. That was the short version. Details of how well different lenses function and what are the compromises is covered in the second video. Part 6. One more significant issue you might not think about is putting in a lens of the appropriate power. Improvements here are not much talked about, but it is a big part of how good your vision is after surgery. In the eye, the total focusing power comes from the combined power of the cornea and the lens. Sharpness of vision depends on how close the focus distance comes to matching the distance to the retina. When you remove the natural lens, you have to replace its contribution to focusing power. How do you know how strong to make the replacement lens? Just like height, eyes vary in length and curvature, so you can't use the same power implant in each person. To calculate replacement lens power, we need to know three things. First, the power of the cornea, which can be measured by its curvature. Second, the length of the eye, which we used to measure with ultrasound, now by interferometry. And third, we need the position of the replacement lens in the eye, which must be estimated. For simplicity, we choose one of the early lens calculation formulas used in the 1980s. These two terms are from the eye. K is for keratometry, measuring the curvature of the cornea. L is for length of the eye. A is the manufacturer's lens constant for a particular model of lens. With a little arithmetic, the result is the lens power for a zero prescription or emetropic result. You could adjust the power if you wanted a different result, say to end up myopic, or to match the other eye if you're only going to operate on one eye. This formula lacks the term for lens position, which is taken into account in the more recent formulas. Since the 1980s, a number of lens formulas have been developed, trying to improve accuracy of prediction. Using different calculation strategies and different numerical constants. How accurate are they? This 2018 study surveys the accuracy of the major lens power calculation formulas in a large sample of over 18,000 eyes. Note they were done with monofocal lenses. On the x-axis is the axial length of the eye. Average length is just under 24 millimeters. On the y-axis is the difference between the predicted post-op refraction and the actual result. One way to interpret this result is that the calculations are very accurate for average length eyes, but the further the eye gets from average, the less accurate it becomes. Putting the prediction error in perspective, it is actually very low. In this study, for the average range of axial length, the accuracy is within plus or minus one quarter of a diopter. In general practice, according to one expert, 78% of surgeries currently get within plus or minus a half a diopter of their target. Regarding the formulas, surgeons each have their own preference for which formula to use in which eyes. This is an older but nice illustration of the idea of choosing a formula based on axial length. Some surgeons run the numbers through several formulas and decide between results. One last item. The gray line shows the number of implants done at each power in this study, which reflects general usage. Low power lenses are for myopes, higher power lenses are for hyperopes. That concludes our introduction to the origin and major developments in the evolution of lens implants. We saw the first implant as a simple disc made out of the same plastic as an airplane canopy. As surgical techniques changed, so the lens designs evolved with them. Extracapsular surgery, because of the advantage of the retained capsule, came to dominate. The first improvement to the lens was to add arms to stabilize it in position in the eye. The next improvement was to make it foldable to take advantage of the small 3 mm incision size. Current research is ongoing into improving multifocal lenses, trying to cover the range of our daily activities. 
The aim, as we said at the beginning, is trying to copy the exquisite function of the natural lens. In video two, we explore the range of current lens implant designs. We will cover the general types with the advantages and compromises that would be useful to someone who is choosing a lens. In the end, the decision to have surgery and choice of lens requires a thoughtful discussion with your surgeon, depending on your individual needs and preferences.